Thank you uh, so much, Jim, for the nice introduction. I'm uh, thank you also, Sergio, for the invitation. I'm I'm of course super happy to be here uh, with you in this wonderful virtual room, um, uh, and uh, hopefully uh, soon in real again. Uh, and so uh, I have the big pleasure of introducing a, a research uh, project of mine that I'm working on, as Tim said, about digitalization and the wealth estate. This has different facets, um, as you will see, and I'm going to talk about this in detail later. Um, it's part of this cluster of excellence uh, uh, that, that Tim also mentioned in the cluster, although it, the cluster is way bigger, we have about 20, 25 projects running overall on different uh, parts of the uh, uh, politics of inequality topics. So this, uh, if, if you feel interested in this, then please check it out. And we also have uh, fellowship opportunities. And actually, um, this was still arranged uh, when Bernard Ebbinghaus was uh, still uh, the, the head of um, the, uh, uh, the, the department uh, in Oxford. Uh, uh, Oxford is one of our institutional cooperation partners, um, uh, and, and this doesn't mean anything formal. It's just more or less an informal thing, but it actually means that we just now have a, a special program uh, for incoming visiting doctoral fellows uh, where we provide some financial support also for people uh, such uh, maybe as some in the room who want to come from one of our cooperation partners to concerts. So if uh, you want to uh, know more about this, just let me know and uh, write an email. All right, back to the topic at hand. Um, uh, I want to start with a uh, uh, general introduction, basically by saying that this uh, the idea or the question of the association between technological change and the welfare state has actually been at the core of uh, welfare state research for, for a long time. So it's that by itself is actually nothing new. Uh, and I would even say that much of the, the research on the political side of, of the welfare state is really about this relationship between the socioeconomic driving forces of welfare state development versus the political driving forces. So again, uh, uh, technological change has always been part of this story. Um, and the different phases of economic development <clears throat> have been quite closely aligned uh, I'm not saying where, what, what's call, causing with, uh, which, which is ca causing which year, but uh, de facto they have been closely aligned with different phases in welfare state development up uh, until recently when uh, the age of globalization post Fordism uh, was associated with the rise of the social investment welfare state. So basically what we do in this project is to continue looking at this question, but uh, of course adding a new perspective by asking, will this current wave of technological change that we are experiencing and that, that is unfolding and that we see already, already happening on the horizon, will this lead to a new welfare state paradigm or is it rather old wine in new bottles? Um, and uh, I think, uh, although we can discuss more about this in the Q&A, there are good reasons to expect that this time might actually be different. Uh, and that this time there might really be um, uh, some aspects of the welfare state that could, could be uh, uh, strongly uh, affected by this. But of course, there are also other aspects. We know uh, uh, the, the power of path dependence uh, that, that re will remain rather going uh, along established path. But, and that's me as a political scientist speaking, I would say that it's always in the end about politics, the political struggles about distribution and redistribution uh, will remain at the core of this and also will we decide essentially uh, which kind of uh, future uh, the welfare state has uh, and what kind of what this means in terms of long term inequality. So this is the this is the basic motivation and the basic starting hypothesis and to motivate a little bit this uh, uh, this idea that this time might actually be different I'm just going to give you a few examples that show the the uh, just an extremely fast pace. Uh, of technological change that is even uh, surprising to many experts. So one of the one of the examples that I like to cite here is the example of self-driving cars. And there's this very famous paper by David Otter and colleagues uh, from 2003. David Otter is one, if not the leading economist in uh, the study of the effects of technological change on the labor market. And in this seminal paper from 2003, he wrote, uh, driving a car is is actually no routine task. So this is about what tasks are routinizable, which tasks are not, not routinizable and therefore also not uh, likely to get automated. And he says driving a car is really not, not a, is, it, is a good example for non-routine task because it's just too complex to be done uh, by a machine. You need to watch all the different things and then you have to react and so on. 
And then just a few years later, uh, Google starts with the first uh, Waymo car. And you, you can see this little car here in the, in the picture. It doesn't look very attractive as a car. It also looks a little bit strange. But then, you know, uh, as, a, as a German from Baden-Württemberg, uh, the home of Mercedes-Benz, uh, giving a talk uh, abroad, I feel obliged to uh, bring in uh, an example from our, our own uh, um, uh, renowned car industry. And this is, uh, this is just a prototype here on the other side of a self-driving uh, e-electric uh, uh, mobile uh, from, from recently, basically sh showing that there have been huge advances and these Waymo cars have by now uh, driven, uh, according to Google, so that's uh, uh, to be full, fully transparent here, over 20 million kilometers already on public roads, uh, so outside of test uh, centers and so on, and they are now already uh, self-driving taxis in some uh, cities emerging. So that, that shows that even the experts, um, something that the experts haven't really uh, seen uh, is, is becoming the reality just a few, uh, few years later. And you can imagine if that really uh, plays out in, on the large scale, if you don't need any uh, drivers anymore, no truck drivers, no taxi drivers, then you will have with just one major technological um, innovation, a lot of jobs that are at risk. Another example, uh, creative tasks, uh, is, uh, is also something that people, where people thought, okay, humans excel in creative tasks, such as painting, uh, uh, writing articles, and, and composing music. And uh, admittedly, uh, sometimes there are days where I, I, I think it would be great if you just come to the office, push a button, and say, uh, please write a paper for me, and, 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 and I can just sit back and relax. But uh, hopefully, this day is a little bit off in the future yet. But uh, what, what, is, uh, what is really amazing, I think, to see is that there are now advanced software algorithms that, I mean, they're not creative in a classical sense, that's clear, but they produce uh, things that are uh, uh, pretty close to the products that are supposedly done by creative artists and musicians. Two examples um, here, this is the picture, uh, this is already from 2018, where uh, a picture was painted by uh, an AI here on the right hand side, and it actually creates economic value because it say who would ever be interested in this. It's just uh, people, uh, somebody uh, paid $400,000 uh, for this. But obviously this was because it was the first painting and, uh, um, um, and, and, and uh, it, it, it may also actually show that just the act of putting paint on paper may be done by, by a software, but I think there will always be uh, a premium that, that humans are willing to pay for human creativity. The same goes for music. Um, <clears throat> here's a, a AI software that, that wrote a new Nirvana song, basically combining um, uh, uh, looking for patterns in existing Nirvana tracks uh, and then composing a new one, uh, which sounds pretty close to Nirvana, actually, if you listen to it. Uh, the only thing that they had to add then was the voice of the singer. Um, um, uh, so, I mean, this, these examples are, of course, just uh, just funny funny anecdotes, but they show on the one hand that a lot of the stuff that, that uh, was supposedly just doable by humans can now be done by advanced computers, software, robots. But on the other hand, these examples also show that there's always some kind of human component uh, involved in this. Uh, and, and, and that might already uh, show the contours of uh, how far digitalization uh, and automation may go in the end. But uh, still, I would say to motivate the talk, it just shows, shows okay, there's something different about this time. This, there's potentially something different about this wave of technological change that makes it different from all these historical waves of technological change that have, uh, have uh, shaped the welfare state. What does the research say about this? Um, so this is just a short summary of what uh, mostly labor market economists uh, have done uh, to study the actual effects of um, digitalization on an automation on labor markets. Uh, and surprisingly, there are not, uh, it, it's still a kind of an open question how, how big this development is actually going to be. Um, the challenge here is obviously uh, that this, the change is evolving so quickly that it's very hard to make predictions about the future. And I think uh, the pandemic um, uh, has also uh, really shown people the power of exponential growth. So you could be in a, in a phase where uh, case numbers are really low and then you see a slight increase and you don't really worry and a lot of slight increase, you don't really worry and suddenly things are exploding and then the, the world has changed. And something like this could be also happening with uh, technological change. If you have scaling effects, 
uh, by if one major technological innovation uh, really triggers a, a large scale shifts in, in the labor force. For instance, if somebody invented and people are working on this, something like a universal robot where uh, you basically show it's not a fixed machine, you know, the robots that, pe that, that are used in industry uh, just are uh, clunky machines that do certain tasks very well, but just this one task. But uh, uh, there are people working on universal robots where basically you can train the robot. Uh, and if you can train a robot uh, to do certain tasks and you can retra retrain the robot relatively quickly, then suddenly you can, of course, eliminate whole uh, classes of uh, employment with, with one major technological innovation. And the same with the self-driving cars, uh, the, the self-automated um, uh, supermarket uh, uh, cashier and so on. Um, so this is the power of exponential change. And then the pessimists uh, are saying this could happen and this could lead to mass unemployment. That's a real pessimist, but the, 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 the ones that I'm uh, still uh, skeptical, but not maybe not so pessimist, I say at least there's a lot of uh, labor market polarization that could happen. And there are, is already evidence that this is, this is indeed um, happening in many OECD countries. Of course, there are also the optimists. Uh, this, these are mostly people coming from the tech industry themselves, but not only. Uh, and again, there are some studies about this. Uh, this Asimoglu Restrepo paper is a, is a famous one. Just another one that came out <clears throat> recently about Germany by colleagues here from, from Constance and Mannheim uh, that shows that the number of jobs that have been lost in Germany because of robotization have all been um, uh, replaced by uh, some be actually better paid jobs in the service economy. So. Um, it, it's 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 a it's it, it's potentially a positive uh, uh, effect overall. Uh, it could also increase the quality of employment if you if you can delegate uh, not so nice parts of your job to a machine or a computer. Um, so there are some some op optimists who say that these kind of effects would dominate in the long term. And then there are the skeptics, mostly those that are looking at this more from a historical perspective, that say, well, this time is actually not that different from. Uh, past waves of technological change so that some things will happen, but it's not major uh, breakthrough. And there was a big a task force at the MIT um, on the future of work headed by, again, uh, David Otter and, and some others. And they put together a huge report that came out last year, uh, trying to summarize all the different findings from different studies. And in the end, they, that's exactly more or less what, what, they, um, what they say. So basically, there are major changes ahead. But they are not so dramatic that they will completely upset um, everything. It's it's still in manageable, basically. Um, all right. So as I said before, I mean that's basically my argument or my hypothesis here that still politics is decisive and that economic economist research can only um, take us so far because they show the real effects. But they, what are the political consequences of uh, 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 these effects and what are the social policy consequences? Um, and here, just uh, one or two slides to show you the, the, the data behind this. This is from a study by the OECD um, about estimating the automation risk for um, uh, of employment in different countries. And uh, what you can see here is mostly uh, the difference between the gray bars and the blue bars that are of relevance. Um, the gray bars give you the share of employment that is at high, very high risk of automation, above 70%. Um, so that's actually not so, so much. Uh, it's about 10%, some variation across countries. But the biggest um, effects are uh, uh, expected for, for jobs that where, where tasks that make up occupations, um, a, lo a lot of these tasks will then be automated or uh, uh, um, uh, yeah, uh, rationalized, um, changing overall job structures or occupational structures. Um, so there is a lot of transformation uh, ahead in the next decade or so. Uh, but it's not necessarily eliminating jobs, but rather upgrading jobs, upskilling jobs. Um, and it, of course, it varies a lot across countries. Uh, from Korea, which has already gone through a lot of technologically induced rationalization, so there's actually not that much going on. Two cases like uh, Eastern Europe, Italy, but also Germany. And I think Germany is because uh, we still have a lot of uh, mid-level skilled labor. Um, that so far is not yet automated. We also have string, pretty strong unions who kind of uh, push back a little bit on this. So that's um, that for Germany, it, it might mean that there, there will be quite a lot of um, technology related rationalization in the next uh, decade. This is just to document this polarization pattern uh, that people really have seen a growth uh, 
uh, both in low skilled jobs and also in high skilled jobs and, and uh, uh, a reduction in, in mid skilled jobs. And that's the so-called hollowing out of the middle effect. That's very typical of technological change. And it's different slightly from what we've seen with globalization where it was mostly about skill bias technological change. Um, so basically the highly educated get rewarded and the lower educated uh, uh, are in a losing position. With tech change, it's a little bit different because um, some of the low skilled jobs are very difficult to automate. Think of a hairdresser or uh, something like that. Um, so these kind of jobs actually expand. Um, and uh, uh, the high skill jobs also expand, that, that's pretty uh, uh, clear, but the mid skill jobs are the ones that are, are losing out and putting a lot of pressure on the middle class to either upskill uh, and move upwards uh, the income skills ladder or uh, you know, get downgraded. All right, so, so much for the state of research uh, so far and more on the economic side. And, and now what is the research agenda? What is the new uh, outlook on this uh, uh, regarding um, <clears throat> uh, uh, the implications for the welfare state and social policy making. And um, when Selchuk invited me for this, he, he mentioned this, this book that is forthcoming, Digitalization and the Welfare State with Oxford University Press. And, um, and, uh, and therefore, I don't feel too bad about doing this kind of self-commercial uh, uh, here because uh, I kind of was invited to, to, to talk a little bit about this. Um, and it's actually coming out very soon, should be coming out next week. Um, and uh, I, I don't have a copy yet, uh, but uh, hopefully it, it will come out soon. Anyway, so we, what we try to do, this is joint work with uh, Achim Kemmerling, Paul Marx and Kies van Kersbergen. Um, what we try to do here is really to bring together um, uh, uh, scholars from comparative welfare state research and political economy uh, to think about this, uh, what this implies for the welfare state and, and to and we wanted to, to uh, the authors to think a little bit out the outside of the box. And this is why we also thought the edited volume is really the right format for this, because we, uh, we have some empirical papers in there that really look at empirical data, but we also have some more general thought pieces that uh, as such would probably have a hard time getting published in a, in a, in a standard journal because they, they, are, they are more thinking about this in broader terms. Um, we have basically three se sections, and that's also, I would say, related to the, this research agenda that I see emerging. Um, the first one is about uh, broader trends uh, regarding uh, changing risk structures. Uh, very nice chapter by Torben Iverson and Philip Rehm, and uh, they actually have a whole book coming out, which is uh, uh, about how uh, the big data revolution uh, changes the political economy of risk in the welfare state. Uh, and uh, to simplify uh, a lot, uh, they say that uh, because of the newly available data on individuals, especially in the case of healthcare, uh, it, it, there, there will be a lot of pressure on collective solutions to social problems. So if you can uh, have, if you have data available on individual health risks, for instance, um, there's a strong economic pressure for people to opt out of the public healthcare schemes and to, to, to go towards more individualized private solutions instead, uh, reinforcing trends that we already have seen in many welfare states. Um, there's another big block in the, in the book on the politics, and I think that's one of the first research questions that we are addressing in this, in this project. What is the, uh, the changing politics of the welfare state? How does digitalization affect the changing political landscape? Um, one of the chapters is about changing social policy preferences that's actually going to be also the focus of the rest of my talk after this um, by Thomas Kura and Celia Häusermann. We have something on gender by uh, our Oxford colleagues, Jane Gimrich and Alex Kuo. And we have a chapter on uh, elite discourses, parliamentary debates. I mean, these are just examples. There's uh, over 20 chapters in the book, so I don't want to talk about each of them, uh, but just to highlight a few of the, uh, of the contributions. And then we have a whole range of chapters on different policy areas in the welfare state, and that's actually the, the bulk of the, the volume. Uh, few, two chapters on the platform economy, uh, two chapters on the implications for pensions, very classical uh, field of the welfare state. Uh, of course, one chapter about education, healthcare, um, tax policy. So this is really looking at how digitalization automation affect the changing policy options um, of uh, uh, welfare state uh, policy makers. And that's also, I would say, the, the leading research questions that I see at the core of this potentially newly emerging research area. Uh, namely, uh, does the, the first one would be, does digitalization 
broadly defined, including all these different components, transform the politics of the welfare state. Um, and that's me, of course, as a political scientist looking at this since I'm, uh, that, that's what I'm interested in. Um, and here there are many reasons to argue why that might be the case. Uh, technological change puts new actors uh, on the landscape, namely global technology companies, which, which have a lot of new kinds of power, namely platform power. Um, Kuhlpepper and Thielen have written a very nice paper about this. And uh, we have, uh, as I said, chapters in the volume about it as well. Uh, and especially very few selected uh, tech companies, uh, Google, Facebook, and you know uh, whom, um, are really at the core of this newly emerging digital economy. And so far, we don't really know what that means for the welfare state. We uh, talk a lot about this in terms of data protection issues and uh, uh, access to data and so on. But what that actually means for the welfare state, maybe it doesn't mean anything, but I think it does mean a lot of things because it leads to a, a concentration of economic power. Um, and it will therefore also have uh, consequences in terms of the politics and the political power relationships. That's also speaking to the, this other issue here that um, tech change can also uh, lead to changing power relations between established actors. And one of the uh, first things that comes to mind here is the collective organization of workers, uh, which becomes increasingly difficult because of fragmented labor markets, partly because again of the rise of the platform economy, but also because um, uh, rise of project work, uh, rise of self-employment and so on. Um, so that just reinforces technological change, reinforces ongoing trend towards um, decollectivization in, in uh, worker relationships. Then uh, I think what's also uh, interesting is that there could be potentially new cleavages emerging between the winners and losers of technological change. And uh, I will show you later on some evidence that this might actually be happening. Um, and then finally, this is an aspect that Kathy Thielen brought in. Uh, there could be uh, yet another new cleavage emerging, namely between the consumers of digital um, uh, uh, services and the producers. And I think there, uh, so far, this is not really a salient cleavage, but potentially it could become, become a salient cleavage uh, if you think about such things as Airbnb. So uh, uh, those people who uh, like to travel abo ab abroad, and I've used Airbnb myself uh, many times, uh, and, 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 and uh, have an easy way of renting apartments. But uh, as a consumer of this service, um, you're on the one side, on, and, and on the other side, the people who are potentially crowded out of local housing markets um, because, of, uh, because of the spread of this, uh, these, these platform economies. So I think it's the same with Uber and same with other things. And I think some of these developments have, have now reached a threshold where you can say, it has real economic and social consequences, especially on the local level. Um, and this, there is some research on, on, on this emerging, uh, but it's very little research so far. And it's actually not really coming from the welfare state field. Um, and it's not really connected to um, the local level of the welfare state uh, so far. And I think that's uh, uh, just an exciting uh, research uh, agenda already right there. Then the second one, the second aspect is about the policy space. Uh, uh, to what extent does digitalization, technological change expand the policy space or change the policy space of welfare state reform? Um, and here, this is the question about old wine and new bottles or new bottles. Uh, and I think uh, it's, a, it's a little bit of both. So I would say some things are uh, pretty much old wine and new bottles, uh, lifelong learning, expansion of university education, uh, but there are also examples of new policy instruments that are being discussed. Um, sometimes the digitalization is, is, uh, is uh, discussed in the context of uh, debates about the universal basic income. And I guess Tim can say, say more about this maybe in the Q&A, um, whether that's really a, a powerful political connection or not. I think at the moment, probably not so much. Um, but there are other things, uh, and, and there's a German think tank, the Zentrum Liberale Moderne in Berlin, who made this proposal of an education basic income, Bildungsgrundeinkommen, that is, that is combining uh, uh, this idea of lifelong learning uh, with, with the idea of a basic income, basically saying you could get a basic income uh, for, say, a year to uh, invest in your education, and these kind of policy instruments are actually also discussed in Germany in the context of digitalization. In Austria, they already introduced something like this. Um, and that, that shows that new forms of more hybrid uh, policy instruments are emerging and could potentially um, uh, be the, 
the, the uh, indicating the emergence of, of new policy mixes and uh, new policy um, designs. That's also what I'm saying here in the, in the, in the, at the bottom, that probably the, the policy instruments, policy instruments by themselves are not entirely new, uh, but the way they are combined and the way they are mixed, the policy mix, um, that's, uh, that's probably uh, uh, going to change. And education is still very much at the key here, but it's not everything, uh, as I will also show later with um, empirical data. Um, and I think uh, what, what is also interesting, um, that's the seg, seg over into the second part of the uh, I think our speaker is gone, Mario. Okay, perfect. Sorry. All right. So basically, uh, there could be a tension between what is what is politically feasible and what is uh, desirable for the policy perspective, and that's that's the the core uh, of of my second part of the talk, where I'm going to talk about an empirical example. Um, this is this is coming from um, uh, uh, or using survey data from a large scale survey that is basically run and managed by the OECD. It's the risks that matter survey. Maybe some of you know this already. I uh, got aware of it only recently before we started developing this. Um, and uh, it is a survey about uh, all sorts of uh, social risks and how that relates to policy preferences. And uh, with financial support from our cluster, we could uh, get access to, or we, we had the chance to uh, include some uh, questions in this uh, about technological change and digitalization in the latest, latest wave from 2020. And uh, here we work together with a team from University of Lausanne, Giuliano Bonoli and, and uh, some others. Uh, and now this is the first uh, paper that is officially coming out of this. It just got accepted last week at the Socioeconomic Review. Uh, so it's, this is joint work with um, Tobias Toba from Konstanz, Mia Gantenberger from Lausanne and Carlo Knotz from the University of Stavanger. Um, and what we do in this paper, so it's a 25 OECD countries, 25,000 respondents. It really re allows um, also to look at um, uh, the impact of uh, welfare state context on, on attitudes and preferences. Although in this paper, we mostly focus on the micro level, not so much on the, on the impact of micro, micro level context. We do that in a, in a different part of the project. So what we do, uh, first of all, here is um, to look at subjective perceptions of automation risk. And here, um, it's interesting to note that these subjective perceptions of automation risks are not necessarily or not directly related to objective automation risk. Uh, if you may remember, in the previous figure, Korea was the country with the lowest uh, automation risk, according to the OECD, ob objective automation risk. But here, most people are, uh, it's the highest share of people who are really worried about this. So it, this is uh, almost two thirds of the population who think it's likely or very likely that their job will be replaced by a robot computer software uh, algorithm or artificial intelligence in the coming five years. So they are really, really worried about this. The explanation is pretty obvious. They already have experienced this. So they are really worried, but they are actually already through. Uh, vice versa, uh, Austria and Germany, on the other hand, where uh, the, according to the OECD, the objective risk is pretty high. Uh, people are not yet so worried about it. Uh, and, and that also shows that um, uh, uh, this is just interesting to pursue uh, the relationship between objective and subjective automation risk. Unfortunately, the, the survey that we have here doesn't really allow us to do that directly, to do directly this kind of comparison uh, beyond this very simple descriptive stuff. Uh, we are actually in the process of um, uh, setting up and, and uh, putting into the field uh, our own survey for the, from the cluster project, um, which will only cover six countries, but at least it's six countries, and it will go into the field um, in the summer, uh, probably where we have uh, both objective measures or indicators that we can use to construct objective risk measures uh, on the one hand and subjective perceptions of uh, automation risk on the other. And then we can say directly how the two are related. But here, just for now, the important message is people across the OECD world are really, really worried about this um, in, in most countries. So even in those countries where people are less worried, it's 25% it's, uh, of people, 30% of people who are still pretty worried about it. And there's huge variation across 
uh, OECD cases. Um, what did we do next? Uh, we then, uh, to give you a little bit of an implication, how uh, this 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 uh, uh, this is again just purely descriptive, how uh, these subjective risks are correlated with other things. Um, the Lausanne team will actually write a, a whole paper. I mean, this is Giuliano Bonoli's interest, of course, in, in social risks and, and related things. Uh, how this uh, subjective automation risk correlates with uh, uh, with socioeconomic variables and so on. Um, but here you can see uh, it's 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 uh, negatively correlated with income, as you would expect. So higher income people are less uh, worried about it. But it's it's a uh, it's it, at some point it levels out. But basically, it's not completely negative until the very end. It's not a, a linear association. And you can also see that this variable is going to become important here. The one about constant ICT use. We we look at people who use advanced technology on their job. And here, um, uh, on average, people using a lot of technology uh, on their job are less concerned about this, but there are still quite a lot of people um, worried about uh, automation, even if they are using a lot of technology on their job. And it totally makes sense uh, because um, you know, a high-skilled software engineer uses a lot of technology. This person is probably not worried about losing a job because the person knows uh, she will be in high demand because she can do very fancy things that a computer cannot do. Uh, but if you have somebody working in the back office uh, of a big uh, company using technology all day, but you can they can already see uh, uh, how how they might be replaced by uh, software in in the in the near term, then then you can see that there might be a lot of heterogeneity in the group of heavy ICT users. All right. Um, Next, moving on, because that's what we're going to study in this paper, is how this subjective automation risk is related to social policy preferences. Here, again, just a descriptive graph. Um, uh, uh, what is the share of respondents who support or strongly support different policy measures um, that should be pursued in response to technological change? Um, and here, the first uh, two, A and B, are about education, investing more in university, vocational training, further training. This is broadly supported um, by the people. And we actually know that also um, from, from previous work on public opinion on education, uh, that this is really uh, very supported. What is only medium uh, supported is the, or modestly supported is the universal basic income. This is uh, um, option G introducing a universal basic income, 60%. Um, also, basically on the same level of support is making unemployment benefits more generous. Uh, you could say compensatory policy used to be, uh, or is actually also very popular, uh, but we also know from the deserving literature, maybe not the expansion of unemployment insurance. So um, this is basically on the same level again. Uh, we have some other options that, uh, uh, such, such as uh, reducing the number of working hours, uh, option number E, um, investing more in the digital infrastructure, where you could say, well, that, that should be a no-brainer, but it's only 62% who support that. Um, and then uh, the least support uh, uh, is achieved by the proposal to introduce a robot tax um, on technology companies. Maybe it's because people just don't like taxes overall, but a little bit hard to say. But anyway, so uh, what this shows is that social investment policies uh, are very popular across the board, um, uh, but maybe not uh, among those that are directly affected by this, uh, uh, perceiving high levels of subjective risk. What we then do in the next step is to uh, construct a factor variable. Um, and here is the, the, the factor scores and below is a figure. Um, so it actually quite neatly um, uh, uh, maps onto two factors and we call um, one uh, dimension uh, social investment uh, dimension and the other one is more the compensatory policy dimension. Admittedly, if you look at the actual policies, uh, you know, that sometimes works in a more straightforward, for, straightforward way and sometimes it's a little bit uh, less straightforward. So for instance, the digital infrastructure aspect loads uh, heavily together with the uh, education and training stuff. But you know, it's a kind of investment. It's a physical investment rather than a social investment. This is why we also kind of broaden up uh, our understanding of investment-oriented policies here a little bit. Um, and then on the other hand, you see the, the, the basic social compensatory policies 
um, unemployment benefits, universal basic income, but also something like reducing working hours and in including robot taxes. These are, of course, not compensate, sorry, compensatory policies by themselves, but they are a little bit more um, uh, in the flavor of uh, uh, traditional redistributive policies. Uh, uh, that's that's how, how we would justify give, uh, or explain why these items are loading on the same factor. And here you can also see that there's a lot of variation uh, in support uh, for these different policies across countries, um, but the patterns are not that clear cut. So it's, you know, if in terms of policy feedback effects, it's not a, a clear cut case. So uh, in this uh, paper that I'm talking about, we are rather looking at the micro level uh, uh, associations. So speaking about the micro level, these are the results from uh, regression analysis, um, uh, uh, hierarchical models uh, where, where individuals are nested in countries. And we also apply Bayesian uh, uh, framework here uh, to, get, to get more robust estimates, uh, although it doesn't really matter that much if we just use um, uh, classical uh, uh, random effects models. Um, so what, what the main message here is, is up in the, the first two rows of um, the left-hand um, figure. The first variable is the subjective uh, automation risk, as I uh, showed before. And the second one is uh, indicator whether people often use uh, uh, sof sophisticated technology in their job. Um, and what, what this shows is that people who have a high level of subjective automation risk are significantly less supportive of social investment policies or investment policies, but significantly more uh, likely to support compensation or protection policies. Um, so this is a pretty clear and pretty strong effect. You can see it's pretty far away from the zero mark and it's highly significant. You see the opposite pattern if it's about tech users. Tech users are on average much more likely to support investment policies. Um, and much less likely to support uh, compensatory or protective policies. Um, that's also what we see in terms of income. Uh, that's that more what you would expect uh, uh, in terms of age. Old age people are generally more in favor of social policy. It's not a, not a linear effect, um, but uh, that's also to be expected. Uh, highly educated people are behaving like tech users. Uh, and here you can also see the contours of a potential cleavage <laughs> between highly educated tech users being more supportive of investment policies and uh, uh, less educated uh, people who are um, uh, also uh, kind of worried about subjective um, automation uh, and, and they are uh, much more in favor of protective policies. The right-hand figure basically replicates all this and you can see that the, the basic effects remain constant. Uh, what it adds uh, are macro level variables. So we do do a little bit of this macro level stuff in the paper as well, but it's not in the focus. Uh, adding uh, levels of uh, spending on active labor market policies, levels of spending on passive labor market policies, a measure of occupational change, <clears throat> how much the labor market has already upskilled in the last years and um, general uh, level of unemployment. And so the, especially the unemployment variable makes a little bit of a difference. People in countries with high levels of unemployment are generally more supportive of um, social policy. That's not surprising. But basically, the most important thing here is that the micro level effects don't, don't get affected by this. <clears throat> now, uh, as I said before, there is a lot of heterogeneity in the group of uh, ICT and tech users. Um, and therefore, we looked at the interaction. We also look at the interaction between subjective automation risk and income, education, and age in the paper. But here, I'm just going to focus on the interaction between uh, risk perception and uh, uh, whether somebody is using technology on the job or not. And the interesting thing that one could see here is that the higher the perception of risk, uh, the stronger the convergence of preferences. So basically, uh, uh, even if you are a tech user and in generally more supportive of investment policies, uh, if you are experiencing more subjective automation risks, you start to behave more uh, like a, a person who's, who's really worried about this. So the, the subjective risk trumps the, the fact that, that this person is using tech uh, technology at the, um, at the job. Basically meaning that whenever people are really worried about um, automation, then they start becoming more supportive of compensatory policies and, and uh, less supportive of, um, of investment-oriented policies. 
Um, I have maybe two, three minutes left, so I'm just going to run very quickly through some extensions of this, and we can go more into detail in the Q&A. Uh, one, one criticism of our uh, question uh, framework could be that uh, you could say, okay, these are all items that, and, and basically people, uh, people could reply yes to all. And we know that there is this kind of positive response bias in, in questions and attitudes towards the welfare state, uh, when especially with, with regard to spending questions where people just like to have more spending on all the different dimensions. So we have a different setting um, uh, in the paper in the in the survey where we uh, force people to make a choice. So we give them uh, a, a fixed budget of 100 currency units, and they have to uh, distribute these currency unions uh, across five different uh, policy areas, including education, retraining, and, and social compensatory policies, so basically the same two dimensions as we have before. Um, and uh, this is getting a little bit more uh, sophisticated in terms of methods, because obviously these responses are related to each other. Um, uh, so, so you have to take that into account to the modeling. And this is done by, together with my co-author, Tobias Toba, who is the expert on this more sophisticated method stuff here. But basically what we can see is the same story, the same pattern that people who um, uh, have a higher subjective risk of automation are uh, more likely to support uh, transfers and less likely to support investments in social investment and, and further training. Uh, and also the tech users uh, where it's the opposite, uh, high tech users and the highly educated uh, are much more supportive of social investment and less supportive of, um, of compensatory policies. So this is, this is basically showing the same thing using a very different question. And I actually just published a paper last year, or was it this year? No, last year, in the Journal of Social Policy uh, using data from the ESS, um, which is in many ways imperfect. This is why we did our own survey. But basically, we find a very similar picture here, namely here we're using actually objective automation risk that uh, people who are at high risk of automation are more likely to support redistribution uh, but less likely to support um, uh, active labor market policies, uh, so social investment policies. So basically, uh, and Thomas Kura and Silja Häusermann in their chapter using yet again another data set find exactly the same thing. So this emerging pretty robust finding that people who are uh, mostly at risk, either objectively or subjectively, uh, of being the losers of technological change, have a strong demand for compensatory policies not so much uh, for social investment for policies. Uh, although you know, from a policy uh, consulting perspective, basically, or that's what policy experts regularly recommend uh, to do when, when thinking about what should we do about digitalization, invest in education. Yeah, but uh, that's not the only thing uh, that may be needed because uh, those people directly affected by this, they don't really like that so much. They would really demand short-term compensation in order to, to be able to deal with this. Um, and uh, uh, therefore, I would say in terms of the policy implications, uh, you need a, a more balanced strategy uh, um, uh, to, to deal with this. Uh, and uh, in terms of research questions, uh, I would say uh, one of the interesting issues that we want to pursue next is this relationship between subjective and objective automation risks. Um, and uh, especially the, the measurement of objective automation risks is also quite tricky. Uh, we're trying out something in this new survey that, that I mentioned before, um, uh, uh, using uh, a method that Aina Gallego tested out in, in another survey in Spain, uh, where you just basically uh, give a set of tasks to people. And uh, we know from other research which of these tasks are at high risk of being automated or not. And then you can use this task measure to construct objective uh, automation risk. But um, that's, that's one way of going on about it. We, we will see how that works. Uh, but I think it's an, it's an important question. And also more from the political side, I think the challenge is really what to do about the, this potential mismatch between what experts think should be done in response to um, technological change and what, what people who are affected by this actually prefer. Um, and uh, there's also some research emerging on the role of technological change uh, as a driving factor of populism. Uh, and of course, that's therefore, and, and Tim has also worked on this for the special issue that we did with West European politics. Um, uh, you know, uh, there's a potential uh, risk here that uh, you know, losers of technological change uh, are increasingly turning to populist, uh, populist parties. And therefore, the question of uh, how can we design 
compensatory policies that that, that might prevent that is, is a very important political one. All right, so much from my side for now. Looking forward to the discussion. Thank you.